individuals who don't even know one another into a single powerful impersonal entity. And violence becomes impersonal too. Now the person who kills you doesn't even know your name. He knows your tribe or your race or your religion. And that's enough. Take the Zulus, for example. Two centuries ago, the Zulus were a single clan of only 1,500 people, quietly herding cattle in the hills of Natal. There were no big tribes in South Africa then. But in the early 1800s, a military genius called Shaka turned the Zulus into a disciplined army, a step that Zulus of later generations reenact at the drop of a hat. With their new kind of army, the Zulus began conquering the neighboring clans. Shaka quickly overran most of Natal. And then something odd happened. The people whom he'd conquered started to think of themselves as Zulus too. Terror played a part in it, of course, but so did the intoxicating sense of importance that comes from being part of something so big and powerful hundreds of thousands of people actually began to believe that they belonged to the same group. So the Zulus suddenly became a fully-fledged tribe. Or nation, if you like that word better. And it wasn't just the Zulus. The wars forced all the clans to merge into big tribes. And in other circumstances, these new tribes, Sutu and Koza and Zulu, might have ended up as a bunch of separate black nations. The map of southern Africa would have looked like the map of Europe. But it was not to be. Instead, the Europeans arrived and conquered all the black kingdoms. In white-ruled South Africa, blacks were drawn into the cities as cheap labor, and their tribal identities were paved over. All blacks were treated the same, regardless of tribe, and treated very badly. Eventually, it drove them to a revolutionary conclusion that the only way to overcome oppressive white tribalism was to have no tribes at all. One person, one vote. The African National Congress was founded 80 years ago on the principle that everybody who lives in South Africa, black or white, must have equal rights. No special racial privileges, no tribal distinctions. From the 60s on, the ANC was banned and persecuted, but its jailed leader, Nelson Mandela, came to embody the non-tribal ideal. And with the release of Mandela in 1990, the ANC was finally on the road to power. However, there will always be somebody trying to build a political career on appeals to tribalism. And the tribal identities were still there underneath the pavement. It was the white government that appointed Mangasutu Butulezi as leader of the Zulu tribal homeland and Butalesi played right into their hands. He built up his power base by creating a Zulu nationalist movement called Inkata. And therefore you can trust me because I've never told you lies. Butalesi came to embody the tribal ideal, but many Zulus rejected it and backed the ANC. So in the early 90s, a kind of black civil war broke out, and it became clear that white hardliners in the security forces had been passing arms and money to Inkata for years. As the election neared, the most paranoid rumors were taken seriously.
Nee, nee, ik was nog nooit een fucking groepje van mensen wat zelfs is democratisch dan fucking schietelen mensen doen het niet. Oké, nu. Ik ga er eens voor. The ANC was not plotting to assassinate Budalesi. In fact, it was doing everything it could to persuade him to take part in the election. But out in the townships, the situation was awful, with Inkata and ANC supporters killing one another and elements of the police provoking more violence in the hope of making elections impossible. On this day in September 1993, Wally Mbele is in Ketlehong, a big township east of Johannesburg. This is one area which has been hit hard by violence. Close to 1,000 people have, have already died this year in violence. So they are calling the stay away to protest against the continuing violence. They are also protecting against the police handling of, of the situation. You know, the, this place has become nothing less of a war zone. Now it's military drugs, it's police drugs, you know, which makes it completely a township under siege. Mm -hmm. It's quite difficult. I'm really scared. I'm really scared because this violence, it has come to live with us. The police claim they see AK-47s in the crowd. They fire into the crowd. Four people are shot. And Inkata kills three other people in Katlehong later in the afternoon, while the police are nowhere to be seen. Those are the people we should be looking to for safety, for peace, for law and order. But, but they seem to be the same people who start violence. And if the people who are supposed to maintain law and order to create a situation of peace conduct themselves in that way, it makes one hopeless for the whole situation. There's no way one can look for, you know, for, for safety. They should be maintaining peace, but they seem to be creating violence, more and more violence. It's a hopeless situation, honestly. Max Dupree's family has been 14 generations in South Africa, and he was born in the rural Afrikaner heartland. But then he got a job as a journalist in Johannesburg, and his paper sent him to cover the Soweto student uprising of 1976. It changed his life. Looking at 15, 16 year old black kids standing in a group in confrontation with the police and the police would draw a line and say any person who steps over this line will be killed and there would be a, a little mutter and then a kid would stand up and raise his fist in the air and walk over the line and he would be killed and his body would lie there on that line and uh, after a couple of minutes, the next guy would come, and he would do the same thing. And I stood there, and I couldn't believe this. And for the first time, I realized, really, that the only way is an open democracy. I think everything in this country should be underst understood in terms of history. Certainly the Africana mind, the Africana mentality of apartheid should be understood. But let's cut the sermon short and say, uh, nobody's history had been as distorted as the Africana's history, because he wrote most of his own history. The first Europeans arrived in South Africa 350 years ago. They were not a tribe yet, not even a clan just a few hundred impoverished Dutch families and some French and Germans. 
The settlers spread inland from Cape Town and soon they lost touch with the outside world. Surrounded by children, servants and slaves, they lived on their isolated farms as though the Middle Ages hadn't ended. They called themselves Boers, farmers, but they were really more like miniature medieval barons. Just as poor, just as ignorant, just as independent. And then the dream time ended. They fell under British rule. In the 1830s, tens of thousands of Boers abandoned their farms and headed north into the unknown interior of the continent to get away from the English religion, English language, and English law. It was called the Great Trek. They didn't want to get rid of their slaves as they wanted to. Many of them were, f were running away from the law. They were a rough bunch. They were a real rough bunch. They were a bunch of illiterate people, a lot of incest going on, uh, God-fearing in a sense, but they had no preachers. They couldn't read the Bible. You know, for years they trekked with ox wagons through the mountains. Um, no, I think that is great. I, lo I love that part of the history. Looking back, Afrikaners of later generations saw the Great Trek as the moment when their tribe became self-conscious and lovingly recreated it on film. They especially loved retelling the story of Blood River, the battle that sealed their conquest to the black population of the interior. They set up many little republics in the interior, but the truth is that they were not a tribe yet. Two Afrikaners equals two republics, they used to say. The whole point of the Great Trek was to turn their backs on the world again. But the world came after them. Gold was discovered around Johannesburg in 1886, and a dozen years later, the British Empire came north to seize control of it in the Boer War. The Afrikaner armies were destroyed within a year, but the Boers then launched a guerrilla war of resistance. The British only quelled that in the end by burning most of the Afrikaners' villages and farms and rounding up the families of the resistors. Afrikaners were the first people in history to be put into concentration camps. 6,000 women and 20,000 children died of hunger and disease in the concentration camps, almost one-tenth of the entire Afrikaner population of the republics. And after the surrender in 1902, the survivors had practically nothing left. No homes, no money, no independence. The war devastated the people. Um, people were forced to the cities to work as laborers in the mines. They didn't know. It was completely alien. They were humiliated. People started feeling, OK, we speak the same language, we hate the same people, that there was a sense of, let us create a nation, or what they, as they call it more correctly, a folk, a, a people. We have what we call folkspiele. It's our folk dances. Now, I, I can do everything in folk dancing. I know it all. I know all the different dances. I can sing it all. I grew up with it. I did it every week of my life. It's the only social interaction I had with women until I was in high school. It's once a week you're allowed to go and do folk dancing, right? And it was quite a shock for me to realize, but it's a con. Afrikaans folk dancing, folk spieler was manufactured in the 30s by a Dr. Pellissier, went to Germany, and he copied a lot of folk dances in Germany, took most of their melodies, and they wrote lyrics for it. So even now, Afrikaans folk songs are mostly German songs from the Hitler era and just before. So it was completely, completely artificial. It took about 30 years to turn the Afrikaners into a disciplined, united tribe. 
By the time they put up this monument to their ancestors in 1938, the job was done. The way the Africans...